This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Okay, we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. We're doing political stuff this afternoon. And we have a candidate for lieutenant governor right here among us, uh, Senator Will Sparrow from the Hawaii State Senate. Welcome to the show, Will. Thank you, Jay. I'm very happy to be here with you. Yeah, great. So we have lots of questions. So, you know, how is the Senate these days? I mean, we, we had a little discombobulation there last spring. Sure. Uh, what was the process involved and how will that play out in 2018? Well, after session, as you know, there were some changes. And then there was a major bill that was this sort of um, hanging with the rail. So we were recently able to pass a rail bill that will get funding all the way to Ala Moana Shopping Center. And it looks like the federal government is OK with our f funding plan, if Mom I would, yeah. read the news correctly. Yeah. And recently also uh, confirmed some judges. Uh, that's part of our responsibility as a state senate. And overall, things are settled now in the Senate. Uh, next year is a big year. Um, half of the Senate is up for re-election. Wow. And some of, them, some of us are, are running for other seats. Yeah. Uh, but certainly, I think uh, a lot of the issues that we took up this year that didn't pass will probably be taken up next year. Um, for example, uh, Airbnb um, collecting taxes or not, um, possibly debt with dignity, Oh, yeah. Mail-in voting. Yeah. Um, I had some housing measures where we needed to fund some huge amounts into our infrastructure, especially now that the, the rail transit developments are going to occur and the state is the largest landowner along the, the rail okay, system. Right. And hopefully that will help us with housing. You know, and, and there's a slew of other issues we'll take up. HSTA had an education tax bill that would have raised hundreds of millions of dollars and earmarked strictly for education. So, you know, those and others will certainly come up. You know, I had a measure to ban sunscreen that had oxybenzone and that has uh, received tremendous, um, tremendous attention, uh, not only in Hawaii, but internationally. And, and so um, that and many others, I'm sure you will be hearing and, and some that probably haven't been um, brought up will be coming up. Yeah, you've been very productive in the legislature. You've been productive on many issues, including the issues you mentioned, but on others too. And I recall, forget where I saw this, but uh, uh, you've 95 of your uh, measures have been adopted by the Hawaii State Legislature. Yes, I've been fortunate. Um, and that's 18 years in the state legislature, of course, not just um, you know, a nine, short period nine. of time. So, <laughs> so they all add up over time and um, I've been fortunate to get some bills passed and, and, and be productive and, and um, see some of uh, my bills uh, become law and that's very yeah, that's um, gratifying. rewarding and gratifying, yes. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and now I'd like to take that experience and knowledge and, and contribute but at the executive level and use what I've learned to, to look at uh, the state in terms of uh, managing it um, from a different perspective. Yeah, now that's it's really interesting. I mean, it's not dissimilar from Colleen Hanabusa going back from Congress and uh, you know putting her, putting her, staking her political career on on uh, the governorship. Um, so, um, do you lose anything in terms of leaving the Senate in order to run for lieutenant governor? Well, I am in midterm right now. In other words, I won re-election in 2016. And so to run in 2018, I will have to step down uh, when I file, which is in June. Mm -hmm. And then the election is August 11th in the primary and on to November 6th, which happens to be my birthday. Well, so maybe that's a really good thing. It, it, it might be a good sign and some <laughs> foreshadowing and, and we will see, but, but certainly uh, you know, after 18 years in the legislature, I feel that this is a good time to move on. I'm 56 now. I'll be 58 next year, and, and I, I want to, to to leave a, a legacy that I'm proud of, that I could work with my colleagues to improve Hawaii. You know, I am concerned that our state is becoming a state of haves and have-nots. Yeah. And you can see it in our homeless. You can see it in the price of housing. 
and uh, we need to do more in government to improve the quality of life of our residents and make certain that our children and others don't have to move away to the mainland to, to have a decent living. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not easy, though, because these, these processes you've described have been in, in play for a long time, and various um, you know, initiatives have come up to try to deal with them, and not quite successful, I think. Um, so why is your administration, your, I mean, as Lieutenant Governor, why, what will you do to really hit these things head on and make them, you know, resolve them? First of all, as the Lieutenant Governor, um, I'll be the partner of the Governor. And whoever wins that race, I don't think I'll have any problem working that it, with that individual. And, and I hope that we'll be able to collaborate together and, and look at the issues that we feel are necessary in order to improve the lives of Hawaii's residents, our elderly, our children, yeah. the working men and women. Yeah. Uh, but I've been, as a senator, working on uh, many issues. And I would hope to also continue working on those. And that includes Know, prison reform, you know, heavy on uh, rehabilitation of inmates, law enforcement reform. I'd like to see uh, a statewide academy and standard for all law enforcement officers, um, That's body cameras and vehicle idea. cameras, right? Because yeah. right now, each agency and the state and the county, they're all different and they're piecemeal. And I think there should be one standard statewide for individuals who have arresting powers, who carry badges, who carry guns. Uh, I've been working on aerospace initiatives to build you know, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics jobs. Some of the low-hanging fruits on there include building uh, a small satellite launch uh, area on the Big Island. Yeah. Um, space tourism is looks like it's going to be coming. We're hoping to get an FAA spaceport license um, uh, for the Big Island. H Hank Rogers Kona is airport. working on that, isn't it? Well, Hank Rogers is working on that, but more more so on the moon base. Ah, that's right. Right. Yes. Uh, but Jim Crisafuli, yes, who was one of the key people in DBED, uh, was working on the spaceport license. That was my legislation. Yeah. Now we're looking at um, building and growing Hawaii as an unmanned aerial systems test site. We're one of seven, seven locations in the nation allowed by the FAA to, to do research and development on unmanned aerial systems. Yeah, drones. Exactly, drones. And as you know, those have not only public uh, use such as um, search and rescue or uh, um, helping with um, beach patrols, um, looking at the forest and land, um, you know, there's so many ways. But there's also the business applications, you know, fisheries, um, agriculture, um, many uses for unmanned aerial systems. I, I can't even think of them all because there's so many. No, but it evokes in my mind a recollection of seeing you at the at Pacific Telecommunications Conference a year or two ago and, and concluding in my mind that you are into technology. You're into the edge of the envelope uh, in, all, in, all, in all ways. And that's why I think you've been uh, so productive in, in creating legislation that, that meets, meets the future. Um, and I, you know, just trying to assimilate this, it just seems to me that as Lieutenant Go the problem with Lieutenant Governor is that usually he's marginalized, or she, uh, if there is a she, I don't know if we've had a she, <laughs> but usually yeah. Lieutenant Governor is just under the shadow of the governor and never really sees the light of day, but you're such a valuable player and you've been involved in the substance of all this legislation. It's not just writing the bill and getting it passed, it's doing the research, engaging with the public, figuring out all the wrinkles and contingencies, this could be very valuable for any governor to have you there. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, some people have asked me, why do you want to run for lieutenant governor when you've been so successful as a state senator? And a couple have even called me an activist uh, senator. <laughs> but I tell them, it's not the position, it's the person. And I expect to be an activist lieutenant governor as well, uh, because I am elected by the people and the people want our leaders to work together and to solve the problems of our state. And if you know my style and how I do things, I will continue that regardless of what title or office I hold. And, and I'm looking forward to having that opportunity. Yeah, I, and I would say in that regard that you're very approachable, accessible, uh, and that in my view, uh, and I wouldn't say this about everybody, I think you're a man of the people, I do. 
Thank you. I think we can talk to you and you will listen to us and you will, we, we will see things through your eyes and you will see things through our eyes. This is a big connection. It's important. I'd like to think that I'm very accessible and even on social media, I have my LinkedIn, uh, Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, and I communicate with, with the public uh, using those um, social media on, on, on many occasions, uh, almost every day. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a short break. Okay. Um, uh, that's Will Sparrow. Um, he's a senator in the, in, the, in the state senate right now. He's running for lieutenant governor. And when we come back from this break, I want to ask him about specific issues, some of the specific issues that he's been involved in or will be involved in as lieutenant governor. It's great to talk to you. We'll be right back. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. We all play a role in keeping our community safe. Every day, we move in and out of each other's busy lives. It's easy to take for granted all the little moments that make up our every day. Some are good, others not so much. But that's life. It's when something doesn't seem quite right that it's time to pay attention. Because only you know what's not supposed to be in your every day. So protect your every day. If you see something suspicious, say something to local authorities. Freedom. Is it a feeling? Is it a place? Is it an idea? At Dive Heart, we believe freedom is all of these and more, regardless of your ability. Dive Heart wants to help you escape the bonds of this world and defy gravity. Since 2001, Dive Heart has helped children, adults, and veterans of all abilities go where they have never gone before. Dive Heart has helped them transition to their new normal. Search DiveHeart.org and share our mission with others, and in the process, help people of all abilities imagine the possibilities in their lives. Ooh. We're here with Willis Barrow, Senator in the State Senate, and we're talking about his, his run for Lieutenant Governor, and during the break we had an interesting conversation, and I asked him, you know, do you agree with me that we are at risk, the state is at risk, the people are at risk, perhaps more now than before, about, uh, you know, negative, negative vectors and possibilities undermining our quality of life and so forth, um, and how we deal with that. This has to be a point in any campaign right now. What's your thought? Yes. Uh you know, Hawaii, in my opinion, uh, we're going through this pivot, and it, it's going to be a, maybe a, a 10 to 20 year pivot. You know, statehood was here in, in 59, and from 59, 69, 79, 89, you know, it was about this new state and the opportunities for others on the mainland and um, what commercial businesses will be here and, and what investments can be made and that was part of the new part of being in the United States of America. Then we came to this part where the newness of statehood ended and, and we went through the 90s and, and 2000 in like where, what direction is our state going? Uh, where will we be heading? And how will our local residents in, be impacted, especially as Every 10 years, more people are coming here, and the cost of living is going up, and tourism is becoming and has become our number one industry, and now we're close to 9 million people, and can we maintain that? What's our capacity? Now we're looking at these bread and butter, quality of life issues that's going to impact Hawaii in the next 20, 30, 40 years. Um, what's the transportation infrastructure going to look at? Who's going to pay for it? The cost of housing, which is impacting everyone today, from the homeless to that first-time buyer. And then what type of jobs, as, as I mentioned. Tourism will always be our number one industry, but we have so much competition from around the world. And we need to be able to diversify and create more jobs and utilize technology to our advantage. because. With technology, you literally have uh, the world at your fingertips. And, and how we use technology, especially within our school system, will be so important. And all of these issues are really going to determine uh, whether the future is going to be a future where the rich and the wealthy control everything and are calling the shots, or can we maintain um, a, an idyllic quality of life um, like the olden days, although the cost of living was going to be a big factor, but um, how are we going to deal with, with just 
the social aspects of a growing population and everything else needed to, to live on an island state with limited land and, and thousands of people coming every 10 years. Yeah, we have to recognize those things, you know, we haven't really recognized them. And uh, the, at the end of the day, we lose our best and brightest, they go to the mainland. At the end of the day, you have that dichotomy, that um, polarization of wealth and culture and attitude in general. And, uh, and, and then you have disconnection from government, lack of confidence in government. All these things are on the, and, and the center of it, I think, is economic, don't you think? Because we have these unliquidated liabilities coming up in, in tens of billions. Um, how are we gonna pay for all that? To me, if we could solve that problem, would it help? Would it really help? Well, what's most important for any state, any city, any country, is to have a strong economy and to have jobs for our residents so that these individuals can not only take care of their families and their needs, but can you know, contribute with their taxes. And we have visitors who will want to come here because this is continually, continually being one of the most um, beautiful places to, to visit. And so you know, how can we complement tourism, for example, with a diversity of jobs? Uh, one area I would like to see more government assistance and help is culture and the arts. Mm -hmm. uh, we have mer ver very many talented and skilled individuals here. Um, artists, you know, painters, sculptors, writers, uh, songwriters, singers, musicians, um, architects, fashion designers. This is what I use, creativity, the innovation <laughs> of using one's mind. And we need to help promote these individuals in, in all of these endeavors. And with uh, branding and marketing and, and the IT that Hawaii, the, the knowledge we have, we should be able to assist these people because the world is our customer, yeah. a billion people. And if we could promote Hawaii as a culture and arts destination, having the best in all of these, we should be able to bring tourists here as well as allow individuals to possibly make a second income, part-time work, and for those that can, a full-time income. So for example, Mary Monarch, that's one of the premier uh, hula competitions and dances in the world. You know, we have Pow Wow, which started um, in Hong Kong and then uh, got a base here in Hawaii that brings urban artists here. Uh, recently, my friend Danny Kassler and his gang just celebrated their five-year anniversary of Pacific Ink and Art Expo, which is one of the best tattoo conventions now in Ho Hawaii. <laughs> and just last year, uh, there was um, uh, Honolulu Biennial uh, oh, sure. that brought 90,000 uh, attendees through seven art locations. Yeah, we covered that. Yeah. And yes. And it was a combination of international artists as well as uh, local artists. And then you look at our fashion, um, and Namba, uh, the gentleman that just recently was in uh, New York Fashion Week. Oh yeah, sure. Right. Uh, local guy. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Um, and we have iconic, um, you know, shirts like, uh, you know, Tory Richards, uh, Zig Zane, Hilo Hattie. There's so much that we have to offer yeah. to the world. Those are our products. Yes. We don't have factories, but we have intellectual products. Exactly. We have cultural products. We have artistic and musical products. Right, and that culture and arts is something that, that the state government can assist and help brand, and, and that's one area I want to do. And then you throw in things like the film industry sure. and sports. And, and, of course, you know, we have a um, Academy of Creative Media where we are now um, educating our children and students to become filmmakers, and those filmmakers can tell the story of Hawaii, and as well as you sure. know, come up with fantasy stories and dramas and mysteries that everyone likes to read. And sports, you know, we have outstanding athletes. Uh, Marcus Mariota, who sure. was a Heisman Trophy winner. Yeah. Uh, Duke Kahanamoku, who sure. was an Olympic um, swimmer. And, and we need to promote Hawaii as a sports destination. We are a sports de destination now, but we can do so much, much more. more. Yeah, I mean, in sailing, in golf, 
Uh, I was just on the Big Island, and they just had the triathlon. And That's our product, the triathlon. Exactly. The Honolulu Marathon brings 20,000 people, I believe, and, and we should do more with like X Games type of sports and even these sports where you could easily put them in a convention center like maybe um, badminton or, sure. or ping pong. You sure. know, the Chinese are big on ping pong. <laughs> They're about to make a huge investment on the west side. They bought some Koolina hotel lots uh -huh. and some existing land between Kapolei and Koolina. And so, you know, there is a market out there for the Asian Pacific arena. There's a market for uh, the um, South America, the Pacific side, and the United States yeah. and Canada. And we, being right where we are, uh, need to take advantage of our location and, and become this uh, gathering place, which we are, which yeah. is what Oahu is called, yeah. the gathering place. Yeah. yeah, that's great. Those are great ideas. I really totally agree with that. And you're not, you know, you're not the first one who said that, but I certainly agree with the way you put it. So uh, how do you deal with some of the, you know, the cultural problems that we have? We have, you know, sovereignty issues. We have activists on so many issues, environmental issues, which are sometimes real, sometimes not. Um, and we have, you know, TMT kinds of issues where people are resisting progress in science. How do you deal with that? How should the state government deal with that? It starts with a conversation. You know, we have to have our government leaders, our community leaders, um, on a regular basis as needed to sit down and talk about these problems that are going to impact us. And if we can't sit down and talk and listen to each other, we're going to have problems. Understanding as well that there's going to be a point in time where decisions have to be made. And some of those are difficult, tough decisions. But regardless, I believe everyone has Hawaii's best interest at heart. And sometimes, many times, we're in an agreement, and sometimes we disagree. And that's where we have to have conversations through our uh, media, through the newspapers, through shows like this, through social media. We have to have discussions at the university level and at the school level, at the business level, the Chamber of Commerce. And you have to understand that you know, we need to be working together. And we need to understand that uh, no one here wants to, to control everything and push people around. We have to treat each other with respect and dignity and understand that you know, sometimes maybe a compromise is needed. But well, sometimes also you need strong leadership. You need leadership that says, no, I mean it, I mean it, I mean it. I'm not going to change my mind. I want you to follow me. Exactly. Uh, but you can't do that without that conversation. And, uh, but I completely agree with you that there is a point in time where we need to be assertive in leadership. You have to have good management. And hopefully that decision is the right one. And, and sometimes you don't know until you implement it. But uh, you know, I feel that I'm the type of individual that can talk with anybody. I, I, I like to listen. And, and I'm, I'm very open uh, to issues and concerns uh, that, that everyone has. And at the end of the day, the public has a good gauge of what's right and what's wrong. And sometimes it's just a matter of listening to the public and then making certain that, uh, that what we do um, does not harm or hurt our local yeah. residents. Well, it goes, it goes to a problem that's happening nationally. And, that, and of course, you have Trump and his base, which are supports no matter what he does. Uh, and then you have the rest of the country who's kind of losing confidence in him. And this has been going on for a long time. Some say it's been going on since Vietnam, uh, where the public is not confident of the government. They, they don't feel that the government represents them or that they are part of the government, you know, which is actually the truth. Um, and I wonder how you feel about that on, on a state level. You know, there's a certain lack of confidence, if you will. Things, negative things happen uh, in the press, uh, either accurately or maybe inaccurately reports it and people get discouraged and they begin to lose confidence in the government and after a while everybody says, oh, foo, I don't want to deal with this issue. I don't want to deal with my relationship with the government. This is really tragic all over the country. Um, do, do you see a parallel there? Do you see this as a, as a, you know, a kind of phenomenon happening in Hawaii? And, and how would you make the public you know, adequately confident? How would you make the public feel that they are part of the government, that the government is part of them, that we're all in this together? Yes, well, what's happening at, at the federal level in Washington, D.C. is 
is so unique and unusual, uh, to use a euphemism. Uh, it's certainly a style in le of leadership that we've never seen and that uh, cer certainly raises questions and concerns. Uh, but that being said, I think it's important that as a leader, uh, you have to be out of front and you have to be honest and you have to be able to, as I said earlier, have a discussion and listen. And then when you make a decision, you have to be able to explain it properly and make certain that people understand your rationale. You expect that based on your conversations and the expertise around you and the public and all the other data and information, you're making the best decision. Mm -hmm. But certainly, uh, the residents and our constituents need to understand the process, I think. That's a big part of it. Yes. And that they um, are a part of it and that their input is necessary. And, and that's where I feel that I can contribute and I'm willing to do as I'm doing now. Um, it's just going to be, hopefully, uh, with the, um, if I have the, um, the voters' uh, support um, at a state and greater level uh, as the lieutenant governor. Uh, I feel that uh, you know, I'm going to be okay between now and, and my elderly years. But I, I'm concerned about you know, that child being born today, that high school senior right now, that college student that has you know, 30, 50, maybe even $100,000 worth of debt, uh, that these individuals are going to get a good paying job, that they're going to be able to afford a house, and that um, government is going to make the right decisions that's going to help them. I want to be a part of that discussion and conversation, and that's why I've been in office for 18 years, and when you add my time with Mayor Frank Fossey, I had eight years, so I've had 26 years of oh government God. experience. You don't look that old, well. Yeah. Well, when you don't have any gray hair, you know, that hides a lot, so. <laughs> Well, I, I think it's great, uh, and I, you know, I, I want to ask you one more question before we run out of time, and that is, uh, um, you know, talk about confidence in government. We uh, we have uh, this this kind of scandalous affair going on with the police in this, the city. Now, of course, that's not a state issue, but I, I wonder if you have any comments on on how we can achieve confidence in that regard, and 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 finally get a new police chief and feel that everything's under control. Well, yeah, that was an area that I was intimately involved in when I was the public safety chairman. And uh, one thing we need to do as a state is have a, a state uh, law enforcement academy. We don't have one where all of our state law enforcement officers are trained properly and the same uh, so that if they move from division to division or agency to agency, we know they have the skills. Uh, that includes our, um, our Department of Transportation officers, our deputy sheriffs, our harbor police, our DLNR officers. Uh, Attorney General has some um, police officers. Uh, and then we need to have good and better oversight of law enforcement, especially at the county level. Um, I feel that it was lacking in the past, and that's why we've had some of these problems at the county level. And uh, I'd like to see more uh, oversight, and more um, public input at their meetings, and then look at areas like uh, um, body cameras and vehicle cameras and, and look at maybe some of the bargaining uh, contracts of our law enforcement officers where sometimes they might commit a crime or do some um, bad behavior and misconduct and then they uh, are terminated and then they have um, possibility of coming back if they um, yeah. with grievances. But so, so there's a lot of areas and that's probably another uh, um, show that we can talk about, but you know this new chief that they're about to hire needs to be a chief that's willing to make reforms, and I, I believe that there are a couple um, candidates that can do that, and hopefully the right decision will be made there. But certainly um, there are areas in law enforcement statewide where we can make some changes and 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 make it better for for all of our residents as well as the officers themselves of which the majority of our officers are professional law-abiding citizens yeah, so yeah. we want to uh, improve their lot as well yeah. your experience is showing and it counts i mean all the years in the legislature and in government in general help you understand these issues and find find a better path and it sounds to me that you would not be the ordinary kind of lieutenant governor you would be more proactive 
and you would, you know, uh, take a role with the governor to establish a joint policy on some of these things. But one thing is clear that you and I have to continue the conversation. I hope you don't mind. Uh, we have to drill down some of these some of these issues you've touched on. Yes. And I hope you'll come back for that purpose. Certainly will do, Jay. Thank you very much. Thank you, Will. Okay. All right. Senator Will Sparrow, okay. running Senator. for lieutenant governor, and joins us today in discussing the issues on in the legislature and in, in, the, in the state in general. Thank you so much. Thank you.